Welcome to the Fail Fast Podcast. Today, we have a guest who's a seasoned leadership professional, executive coach, and corporate training consultant who has served 14 years in the Marine Corps. He's also the founder and author of the Leadership Minute. With us today is Patrick Shepler. What's up, Hi. Patrick? How are you today? Very good, buddy. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem. So 14 years in the Marines, that's a lot of time. Uh, how has that helped you in your life? Um, that truly set the foundation for leadership for me. I went in when I was 17, left home, left my family, my friends, everything from there. And they really ingrained in you um, leadership from day one, whether it's the leadership traits and principles, um, a, a lot of the basics that I have as a leader, I was able to form in the Marine Corps. I guess that seems pretty, pretty logic. Yeah, I, I've never been there, but we see, we see every movie about the Marines and everybody knows who the U.S. Marines are, right? It is yes. pretty intense. So did it, uh, was everything straightforward, everything is nice and easy, or was there any failures along that way? Um, you know, we, we all face failures on an a, on a almost daily basis. It's not, you know, if we're going to fail, it's just a matter of when that happens. Uh, it happened to me a, a few times while I was in the Marine Corps. Luckily, not in combat or anything like that. But a couple of the big ones that stand out with me, the first one is when I got on recruiting duty. So I was 21 years old, super excited. Went into the recruiting office, had four coffees in my hands, ready to go for the guys. And the boss at the time took my coffee and started dumping it out. And I'm just kind of looking around like, what, what is this guy doing? Like, I was super excited. Well, then he filled it up with coffee at Patron and he said, all right, well, we can drink today or we can recruit. So, you know, me being 21 years old, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and drink if that's what everybody else is doing. Well, as a result, we took what was a very successful station and as a result of our constant drinking every day and, and not going through recruiting, we ended up failing as a recruiting station and he got fired. Well, then we had a new boss that came in and this gentleman said, hey, let's go play golf today. Or, Hey, let's go to the movies. You know, again, anything but doing my job like I should have been. And I was like, all right, well, let's go ahead and do that. And as a result of these two situations, always being gone or, you know, always out drinking, it ended up costing me and my family. So my wife moved back to Michigan with our kids. I'm you know, completely devastated. So that added to the drinking and just made it even worse. Well, as this went on over the course of a year with those two bosses, it got to the point where he was getting ready to get fired too. So one weekend I get a call and they say, Hey, don't, don't come in this weekend, take the weekend off. So I'm thinking in my mind, what, what have I done? Right? Like I, I know I messed up a lot of stuff. What, what caused them to tell me not to come in today? Uh, Cause you know, that's, you work weekends when you're working recruiting duty. So I show up on Monday and it was probably seven 30 in the morning. And there was already a gentleman in my office. He's, about 6'3", 6'4", 250 pounds of pure muscle, just this real intimidating factor. And he's got music just blaring in the office. I, I don't even say anything to him. I just go and sit in my desk like, oh, this is not going to be a good day. Mm -hmm. right? He is known to push you, to just ride you completely, just really, really just show you the right way to do recruiting duty. So I'm waiting for him to yell and, and really – lay into me and all of a sudden he turns the music off and he just looks at me says hey let's go to breakfast so i'm like oh no <laughs> something else is going on and we sit down and he goes you know what you failed but it wasn't your fault or not completely your fault you were shown the wrong way to do things out here and i apologize for that he's like you know i i wasn't your boss i, I wasn't there to keep them in line the way that you know i, I hopefully could have done but that was our fault. However, that's not going to happen ever again. Like, so I'm not here to run your station. It's like, I'm not going to do that. I'm here to show you how to recruit the right way. And then from there, every time you do something well, I'm going to drive down here. It's like, I don't care if I'm in Vermont, I will drive down to New Haven, Connecticut, and I will come into your office and I will celebrate with you. It's like, but on the adverse side of that, if you mess up, I am coming down here as fast as I can and I'm gonna visit you. Hmm. It's like, you can have that choice of how it goes. And if you need anything in the meantime, if you have a question, I think you call. 
you ask and I will make sure you get the training you need and any development that you need because I believe in you. And that was just, a, that gentleman changed my life. Um, you know, as a result, I became a recruiting station manager. He spoke to the commanding officer and the sergeant major about me. Um, I think part of it was they didn't have any other options to put in, in place at the time. But he recommended me to run that recruiting station. And as a result, we were in the running for station of the year for that area. I was only a sergeant, so I was one of the youngest ranks that you can run a recruiting station. And at the time, I had just turned 22 years old, so I was one of the youngest individuals to run the recruiting station. So the faith that he had in me and the way that a mentor can change my life is really a way that took my, my absolute failure on the edge of getting kicked out of the Marine Corps for not producing the way I should to being a success almost my entire time on recruiting duty. That's a really fantastic way to, uh, the thing, the way he did it, because there's always two ways of doing things is walking in there and firing you yeah. or, or go the way he did it, which is absolutely incredible that you can actually save somebody's life instead of ruining it. And there you are. You know, the best part about this is that relationship that was established. It wasn't something that, you know, for a month or two, he stayed in contact with me or anything like that. I mean, this is a gentleman who just last weekend, I flew out to New York, uh, met up with another buddy, and we drove to Connecticut to go to for his 40th birthday party. I mean, so we, we have stayed in touch. He's still mentoring me, um, still plays a huge, huge role in my life. Fantastic. And how about the family? You said you lost your family. Uh, how, how old were the kids? Um, at the time, my, my youngest son, I think he had just turned, he, he was actually only a couple months after being born. And then my other son was two years old. And this, um, how long did this drinking and I guess partying lasted for? It, it went on for almost an entire year. I mean, it was every day for an entire year. I would, you know, I'd go to the bar, drink, go back, find somebody to recruit, sleep it off, go back to the bar. I mean, it was just ridiculous for a while until um, finally I realized, you know, what, I, I just can't even put myself in a position to drink anymore. Um, it, it's not for me. It, it leads down a bad road. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you mentioned there was a, a couple of big failures. That's one. What would, uh, What's the other one? So my other one, it's. You know, there's failures that you can control. Like I could have controlled that um, by not drinking or, or doing what I should have the whole time. Yeah. And on the reverse side of that, there's ones that you can't control. So for example, you know, I, I was on recruiting duty for almost nine years. And the second failure was no, nothing I could do. So I was doing great running recruiting stations. I was running a recruiting station here in Michigan that had four other stations outside of it all about an hour apart. So I was required to go drive and see them once a week. So, you know, I'd break it up by day and I'd go see a different recruiter. Well, one day I started getting vertigo really bad um, to the point where it would last three or four hours. I just need to lay down and then I want to take a nap afterwards. So all this went on for a, a month or so where it was every day. And I finally went and seen a doctor for it. And he said, hey, you, you can't drive for at least the next 30 days. Right, so here I am, probably 26 years old, needing to get dropped off and picked up by my wife every day at work, um, not being able to go see my Marines at their office. So it took me really out of my leadership position. I had no idea how to be a leader at that point because everything I was taught was very hands-on. Right? I need to go and I need to check on you. I need to see what you're doing every step of the way. You know, How do I now... I can't even drive to see him. Heck, I can't even drive into work. So as a result, I had to completely revamp my leadership style. And it was hard in the first few months. I mean, we failed, we failed hard. You know, and I, I got stuck in a depression where it was, you know, oh, well, this has happened to me. I can't lead my team. And I started, instead of trying to figure out that leadership technique right away, making excuses for myself, right? Like, well, it's not my fault. I can't go see him instead of focusing on, I still need to find a way to lead them to make sure they're successful. So that failure of that recruiting station ended up leading to me getting medically discharged from the Marine Corps, medically retired from the Marine Corps. Um, 
but those last few months I was really able to develop that leadership style, the hands-off leadership style, working on the relationships, the communication, satisfying those Marines needs to make sure they were successful. Very good. And so that's what got you into executive coaching or? No, there. Uh, so from there, I became a director of human resources for a nonprofit. And I really loved it. It was just completely different. You know, I went from working in the Marines, which is uh, a whole different breed themselves. Absolutely love them. But then I went to, it was all social workers. So, you know, you have two complete opposite ends of the spectrum where they want to talk about their feelings all the time. And that's great and stuff too, but not the best idea to jump right into. But it showed me a lot, a lot about who I am. And again, continue to refine that leadership. But I noticed they had high turnover. I'm talking, you know, 40, 45% turnover year over year. Wow. And nobody was tracking it. The managers weren't trained. So I thought to myself, okay, so something's got to be wrong. Maybe it's just the nonprofit sector. Right, so I need to go find somewhere else. So from there, I became a general manager, and it was sort of the same thing. You know, they had a, a higher turnover percentage as well, nowhere near the 40%, but it was costing the company a lot of income, a lot of revenue. The managers didn't have training. How do we fix that and how do we implement that? And that's what led me to executive coaching and the corporate training and the epic leadership method. Very good. And what is this... Uh... What is the Epic Leadership Minute? So it can take years to train employees to be good leaders, um, you know, using traditional corporate methods or the leadership dogma, hey, read a book, and then we read another book, but no actual training. But using the Epic Method, we evaluate our stakeholders' needs, so our employers' needs, um, and we make sure that we guarantee our clients will see significant positive changes in days and truly remarkable and lasting improvement in weeks versus years. So how does, how does it get measured, yeah, these daily results? So the results get measured in increased employee productivity, uh, decreased employee turnover, employee engagement, and then overall, companies just wanna make sure they have increased revenue. So that's what it ends up affecting. By decreasing that turnover, increasing employee engagement and productivity, we're going to increase the revenue for the company. And can you give me some examples of, or some tips of how to do, uh, how to do that? Yeah, so there's, there's a very simple way, and this is one of my favorite ones. I actually did a video on this yesterday, is asking an individual, what part do you play in the company? Because millennials now, we make up the largest group in the workforce and I unfortunately have to include myself in that um, you know we want to feel significant in what we're doing we want to feel valued like we're part of something bigger than ourselves so if you were to go and ask most employees hey you know what is it that you do here you know imagine you've you're working at a plant you're making car parts and somebody just says oh well I, I work on the assembly line right that doesn't make them feel significant that doesn't do anything it's just okay maybe that person's just here for a paycheck and they're just gonna look for something else to make more. Now imagine if that same person said, or if that manager said, no, you don't just make car parts, right? Each car part that we make goes on in a vehicle that is gonna be part of somebody's memories. Think of some of your best memories involving a car, right? Think about the very first car you got and I see the smile on your face right now, right? You can think of that first car. I think of the vehicle that I had that I brought my son home from the hospital. So you're not making car parts, you're making something that's gonna be somebody's dream that is making memories for somebody. So that, just that little different view that if that comes down from managers, it's gonna spread into the employees and make for a more positive work environment. I agree, I agree 100%. And how do you get the managers involved into, I guess, the acceptance of this? Um, so that really, once we open their eyes and show individuals, so there's kind of the old guard of leadership right now, where very few of them have formal leadership training, right? So we've all kind of learned from what we've seen in the past where, well, if an employee doesn't like it, they can just leave, which is unfortunate. Or you get the individuals that say, you know, why do I need to, I'm the manager, why do I need to explain myself to anybody? Why do I need to explain my decisions? 
Well, that doesn't work with the five generations we have now in the workforce, right? Millennials, again, we want to know why we're being asked to do something. We don't mean anything bad by it. We just want to know what the point is behind it. So if we're stuck in that old guard mentality, then we're going to continue to see our turnover rates rise. Right now, we have a national average of 19% turnover. So this small rate, if you're a company of, say, 100 employees, you're talking almost $80,000, $90,000 you can be spending a year just in turnover. Mm -hmm. And why is this important to you, uh, the company's cultures and developing these company training? Because I, I have seen a lot of great, great companies. You know, the, the nonprofit I was with and the manufacturing facility, both great companies. The problem with it is the management didn't have any training for that culture or anything along those lines. So it can truly ruin the employee's view of that company, right? And uh, now you've got one or two employees that say, well, I'm leaving. I don't like this. I don't like that. Small issues that could have been taken care of that now spread like wildfire. So it's really, we can improve those trends simply by taking care of our employees the right way. And that's something that a lot of managers just unfortunately haven't been taught. Absolutely. I've seen it happen. And then it gets to the point where the, the employees, they start blaming the company, almost like we hear people blaming the government for things. And it's they, they, <laughs> yeah. and, and it, it spreads, like you said, it spreads through the entire business. Yeah. One of the biggest things that I've seen, so I, I go around and I give a lot of different seminars on this. Um, I did nine alone in July. And one of the biggest things that I see is that us versus them mentality, right? It's the employees versus the management. And it doesn't work that way. For, for whatever reason, we, we love that divide. But why? It, it's hindering us. You know, the, the employees aren't, they're not beneath us, right? They are the reason for our success. Why wouldn't we lead them the way they need to be led? You know, that's, that's the biggest reason for me to do this. And that's the one I've seen too. So what's the way to stopping the us against them? Um, it starts with effective communication. So I, I spoke again when I'm going around and I'm asking all these questions at seminars and talking to them. It's always interesting to say, well, how often does your manager communicate with you? And like, well, I get an email from them every day. Well, no, no. How often do you, do you sit down and you actually talk about them and you talk about their expectations? Those things aren't happening anymore, right? Now we've got all this wonderful technology and I can just email you or I can send you a text, but nobody takes the time to make that personal human connection. And that's where it's all going to start. Very good. And in the, the leadership minute, so this is not just a book. The, the Leadership Minute is actually a system, videos. Can you tell us all about that? Yeah, so the Leadership Minute is, it's a multitude of things. So I've got a series of books, uh, two books in the series right now. The next one will come out next month. Um, and then I do daily videos or really some sort of daily information that's relevant to leadership. Um, you know, yesterday, like I said, I did a video and that was about, again, the single biggest impact that people make. The day before that, I released an article that related to turnover and different ways you can engage your employees. So by subscribing to this or by going to the, the site, you can get involved in those different things for free. You can see them, you know, figure out what are some tips, some tricks to make me a better leader as opposed to going right away, um, you know, paying for a membership somewhere or paying for a coach right away. It's a way to get your feet wet and start developing you to the leader you want to be, and more importantly, the leader that your employees deserve. And how to decide what leader to be, because there's a lot of people that talk about leadership, and there's a lot of myths out there. Can you explain what some of the myths are? Yeah, so, you know, I'll go back to that old guard. You'll, you'll have a lot of those leaders telling you the best way to be a leader, and that's to be the authoritarian right? Oh, you, you need to discipline somebody every chance you get. And that's the only way employees will learn. Well, again, that's that old guard mentality. And there's a, a few different ways to lead. But that's when we do this coaching, and we figure out what it is you want, what it is your employees want, 
through the EPIC med method, evaluating their needs. You know, do they need to feel significant? Are you filling that need? Do they need the connection and growth while they're there? Creating a plan to prioritize those needs, implementing controls to make sure we have them, and then confirming that it's the change has been made. Okay, so uh, the authoritarian that you were just mentioning seems to be the style that uh, normally when people will look at you, that's what they would think because of your um, Marines training and all that. So, yeah, we all know that is not the right one now. And how about the opposite extreme uh, of not being authoritarian enough? Do we see those and is that a way to, that's not the way to go? Yeah, so you really need a combination. Um, you know, you've got the, like you said, the opposite end of the spectrum who lets everybody run all over them. And then what ends up happening to that individual? Well, they start doing all their employees work for them, right? It's, oh, hey, hey boss, I can't get this down. Is there any way you can do it for me? And they're not being held to any sort of a standard. So that doesn't work either. You really need to find your own balance on what works for you and what works for your employees. Because my type of leadership may not work in a certain environment, right? I can be sort of an authoritarian at times, again, given my background. But that's what's important about leadership should always be evolving. If you just have one style of leadership, it's, it's never going to work, right? You're never going to maximize your potential or, more importantly, your employees' potential the way you need to if you're leading them all the same. So each person wants to be and needs to be led a little bit differently. So we need to have a multitude of different leadership styles for us. Okay. And if let's say that car factory would um, were hired to come in there and help them with their leadership skills, uh, would you would have to physically go there and have uh, capture what the culture is, what's happening in there at the time? Um, I can go in there or I can fill out sur- or create surveys, have their employees fill out surveys for us. There's a lot of different things that we can do to minimize the cost. Okay. I can, you know, get them on a, there some of their employees on a WebEx like this, make sure they kick their boss out of the room so they can answer honestly. Um, so like I said that there's a few different ways we can go about that to keep costs down. And then you would also have to go down to sometimes Leaders have leaders themselves. So you go through the entire um, ladder, I guess. Yeah, so depending on how in-depth they want to get, which I'm the, the better would be from the very top down to the bottom, um, I, I will sit down with every person they need me to in that company so I can get a realistic approach of what their problems are, what needs aren't they for f- fulfilling through that EPIC method, and then I will create customized training for them. I can create customized training for their executive leadership team, or maybe they just want it for their middle management and I can create that too. Or a big issue that I see as well is there's no leadership development training almost anywhere we go anymore. So most leaders, when they get put in a position, get no training for two to five years in a position. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, you know, it's, Hey, you, you took over, boom, you're the leader. Now you have all the answers. That's it. And you're looking around and you're like, uh, I was just doing that same job yesterday. But again, you're expected to know all the answers. You're expected to effectively lead, but you've never been trained for it. So now you just rely on that old guard that you've been taught. And then I also see something that this is just me imagining that if you do train the leader and he decides to follow the training and change, uh, are the people that are now working below him going to understand that there is a change and what this change is, right? Yeah, so that would start with what I call a coaching call. So immediately, one of the first things I would have those managers do is sit down one-on-one with their employees, five, ten-minute call, and just talk to them face-to-face and say, these are my expectations for you moving forward. What are your expectations for me? Because that doesn't happen anymore, right? How often does a, a manager sit down with their employee and say, what are your expectations for me? That's something I would want to know because I would want to figure out you know, do they have realistic expectations for a manager or am I being set up for failure right away? And then just say, okay, Hey, this is how I expect us to, to work moving forward. You know, I'm super excited to have you as part of this team. I'm super excited to have this change made. And I can't wait to see not the, not just the changes that happen within myself, but the changes that are going to benefit the team 
and make you all more productive and help you all. That's a very good point. So what do you expect from me? That's very good. This yeah, it just doesn't happen anymore, right? Just like we don't say thank you to our employees anymore for, for doing anything above and beyond their job, right? Employee of the month got taken away at most, most places. There's no employee recognition most of the time anymore, right? I, I went to a place or was talking with someone the other day and we were talking about saying thank you to their employees who work overtime. And their response was, well, well, they get paid time and a half. Why should I have to say thank you? But that's that mentality that we've developed somehow in, in America. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. So, you know, why not go up to that employee and say, hey, you know what? I, I really thank you and I appreciate everything you're doing for the company right now and staying late. It takes five seconds. It makes the employee feel better. Whether or not you think so, they're skipping time with either their family, their friends, or doing something else to stay later within that company. Exactly that. Exactly. A tap in the back goes a long ways and it's still free. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, just like the leaders should keep on training after they get into whatever position that they are in, uh, you're also still constantly training and you're currently uh, going after your masters. Yes. Yeah, so excited. Um, you know, finals week this week. So writing lots of papers and those things. Um, then I've got one class left, so I will graduate in December, and then I will start my doctorate uh, in January. So I wish I could go back and kick old 17-year-old Pat in his face and say, hey, make sure you go to school while, you know, your first few years in. But even though I waited, I'm so excited that uh, my family really pushed me to get into this, uh, to make sure I'm continuing my education, because uh, it is something that's very important to me. And now your family that you mentioned is, is not the same one or. That is not. So I, you know, I didn't get back with my ex-wife okay. or anything. Um, you know, we have a, her and I have a great relationship still. Um, you know, it's, we have learned how to co-parent. It's something that we're continuously working on. Um, but I have remarried my wife and I now, we have five kids between us. Um, we have, we each had two uh, apart from previous marriage and then one together. Um, they range from 13 to two years old. So it's always crazy in the house. Yeah. Uh, always something going on. <laughs> but that's, again, that's, that's part of the reason why I got into this type of thing is, you know, a lot of times I found myself at work and a lot of managers and senior management think, well, because of the level I'm at, I need to put in more hours, right? I, I have to work 60 hours a week or this place is going to fall apart without me. I can't take vacations or this place is going to fall apart, right? A, a lot of us get into that mindset and I can't count how many times I had to call my wife and say, Hey, I'm, I'm not, I need you to let the kids know I'm not coming to their game today. But yeah. while I was there, I still wasn't being as productive as I needed to be. Right. Cause we get into the mindset, well, I'm going to be here anyways. I might as well just take a little extra time. Yeah. But by using this type of leadership, by using the Epic method, we increase that productivity, not just in our employees, but in ourselves, increase profitability for the company and allow ourselves quality of life, which is one of the big things that my coach, um, who's also been on your, your show, Stephen Kuhn, um, yep. talks about all the time. Yeah, very good. Very Steve is, Stephen is amazing. Yes. <laughs> and do you think these, um, these leadership skills are the same ones that you can take home to, for example, for the kids? Oh, absolutely. And, and I hope that each and every one of my children um, can pick up on some of this stuff and will pick up on it because it comes down to effective communication is huge. Um, emotional intelligence, which is a, another big part of this. And then the basic needs that every human has. So those three things combine to help us make this epic method. So it can apply to your personal life, to your professional life. It, it doesn't really matter. It can apply to a various scenario um, in your life. Yeah. And you brought up the emotional uh, intelligence, which is coincidentally one of the audio books that I started uh, last week. <laughs> emotional Intelligence 101, I believe. Oh, okay. Um, so mentioning books, what is one of your favorites of all times? Um, there's two that are really right up there. Uh, the first one is who moved my cheese. 
I don't know if you've ever read that one before. I have not. No. Um, it's about adapting to change and never settling because once you settle, um, you know, it's pretty much game over for you. And then the second one is a good leadership book as well. It's called The One Minute Manager Meets the Monkey. And in that one, it talks about, you know, as, as managers, a lot of times somebody will come to us with a problem. And instead of taking a few minutes to train them on the problem, show them how to do to fix the problem, really walk it through them with them, it's just easier for us to do ourselves. So we take it, right? And then we keep taking that from all of our employees. And now our work's getting pushed to the side because we're too busy doing our employees' work. Yes. So and actually, two of my favorite books. Okay, I'll, I'm going to put them on show notes and I'm also going to check them because I'm really curious about... And Ooh. short reads. That's the big thing. They're short reads because my attention span is like that. Um, same thing like my books are pocket books. So a- absolutely short reads. So that, that's my favorite because my attention span is just like that as well. That's why, <laughs> that's why I started listening to audiobooks. Yeah. Because I can still focus with audiobooks and I try to, I try to not do anything else. And uh, unless I'm driving, driving is my favorite thing because uh, I could be driving and listening. With, yeah. There's so only so much you can do. <laughs> so how about your own uh, two books? You have two and, and then they're going to turn these into a series of several of them. Yeah. So my first one actually became um, an Amazon international bestseller. And then my follow-up book, I'm actually offering for free for anybody that goes and subscribes to my website. So they get um, that book for free. That one's called setting goals. Uh, And then on top of that, they'll also get uh, a webinar recording on how to conduct a coaching call. But, you know, with those books, what I'll be doing is for over the next year, but every other month, I'm going to release another small book in that series. So again, they're only 40, you know, 40 pages a piece, but I'm going to make them part of a larger book overall. So we'll take them all. It's, It's thinking of it as, you know, each individual one is a different chapter. Okay. And your book that you have for free on your website you, I am looking at it right now, and that is, uh, which, which website is that? Uh, that is at shuplerconsulting.com, and if they just scroll down just a little bit there, you just enter your email, and it will shoot over the book to you, and this is the book on setting goals. Awesome. And the first book, the, the one that became the Amazon bestseller, what's the title of that? Uh, so that one is actually, I've got, a, uh, you might not be able to sit it, see it up there, but um, my small pocketbook, it's um, <laughs> the Art and Science of Epic Leadership. So it's the Leadership Minute. And again, that's another one that I will send out probably the second month that they're on the email list. I'll shoot that one over to them for free as well as a free gift. So it's normally $9.99, but you know, I'm all about adding value to those who subscribe to me, to, to everybody that I can. So I will get both those books sent out to them. But that's um, the art and science of epic leadership and setting goals. Very good. And it is sheplerconsulting.com. Yep. I'll, ha- I'll have it in the show notes and I'll make sure to put that there. So um, one more thing. Yes. What is something very important to you that you would like to kind of as an advice uh, give out? Um, The the biggest thing that I could say is, you you know, a lot of people don't think they need one, but get yourself a mentor, get yourself a coach. Um, You will be surprised how effective it is and how life changing it can be. Um, You know, I I mentioned I myself have a coach, Steven. Um, He's got a coach. It doesn't matter what you do, you can benefit from a coach or a mentor. So find one, utilize it, take their advice, and you will be amazed by the achievements that you can make. That's, that's absolutely true, Patrick. I was super surprised about probably two years ago. I used to think, and he still is, but I used to think that uh, probably number one in the world was Tony Robbins, and he is definitely up there. But then I found out that Tony Robbins, he has a mentor himself and he's, yeah. he has a coach and it doesn't matter how high up you go. The coach always has a coach. That's what makes a good coach. 
Absolutely. And it, you know, that's one of the big things I really, like we just said, that's what makes a coach. So I have found, uh, you know, you can find a, a coach anywhere. You, you can, you can search on the internet coach and have a hundred things come up, but what makes them a coach? Well, they need to be investing in themselves as well. You know, what do their credentials look like? Do they have a coach themselves? You know, all these different things come into play and most successful coaches and I say most, but if not, every single successful coach has a coach as well. So you can even use them as stepping stones, right? You, you could get me as a coach. You could get Steven as a coach. You know, it, you just go up and up and up and up. Um, and as you continue to evolve in those different things, there's a coach for every aspect of your life. Absolutely. So basically, a good coach could, have, could be coached himself by several coaches. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this isn't just a plug for my coaching. Hey, if you want to be coached by me, that's great. Um, but the important thing is, is get a coach. You know, if it's me, great. If it's not, that's awesome too. I don't care. But do something to better yourself. And this is what I have found to be one of the best ways to improve yourself and your company. I believe so too. I just recently had uh, Richard Kaufman on an interview and he was 23 and a half years also in the military. And one of the things he said is that always be teachable. Oh, yes. So constant learning is one, one of the great things. Oh, yeah. And I, I love Richard. Him and I talk quite a bit on, on Facebook and things like that as well. So Nice. Very good. So uh, before we go, can you let people know where they can find you? So you can go to my website, like I said, and subscribe there for our email list. You can get our monthly newsletter and our free books. You can also find me on Facebook. You can just go to Patrick Shuffler or Shuffler Consulting, and I can be found on LinkedIn at Patrick Shuffler as well. Very good. And if you want to skip the search, you can go to the Fail Fast podcast, and I'll have it on the show notes, everything about Patrick Shuffler and all the links to find him. Patrick, thank you so much. It oh, was, thank you. It was my absolute pleasure. It was exciting having you. And uh, like I said, thank you very much. Oh, I see. My pleasure.